Welcome to another edition of the Big Head Pod here on the Dub Network. Today's show, once again, brought to you by Herman Marshall Whiskey. This stuff is excellent. People I love this stuff. They've, they're have they building a new facility in Wiley, which is going to open in early spring. They are Dallas County's first distillery of handcrafted, award-winning small batch whiskey, patiently aged in new white oak barrels here in the great state of Texas, built from the ground up just like good whiskey and better friends should be. They have a rye, they have a bourbon, and they have a blend, and they are working on a single malt from what I gathered. So looking forward to that, and this stuff is very, very good, especially just straight over some ice. So like I said, this is, love this stuff, and like I said, go find your local liquor store and pick some up. So today we have a little bit of a special guest here. This is a little bit, a little bit different. I know I've talked, you guys know I deal with the military a lot, and um, this gentleman here today is here to tell his story, and you guys will be able to see it here soon. But I'm going to let you listen in to Mr. Denver Morris. Denver, how are you, sir? I'm great. I appreciate you, Kevin. Can you can you state your name and rank, please, while yeah. we're sitting here? Um, Denver Morris. I was, I got out as a lance corporal out of the Marine Corps. Okay. What year? Were, what year did you? Uh, I served from '05 to '09, deployed to Iraq in '07, Afghanistan, 2008. Okay. And what led to? You getting out your four year service, the service time, or I mean, me getting out that was, um, I was done, I was tapped out after four years going to a couple wars, doing what I had to do. I was exhausted, you know, so I got out <laughs> mentally, physically. It's just, I was mentally, you- mentally exhausted. Um, to be honest with you, it was, I was tired. The wars, the two wars, we lost 21 in, I, or I'm sorry, eight in Iraq, 21 in Afghanistan. So, Getting out, it was just, I was done. I was only 21 years old and seeing all that stuff, so. So what made you enlist? That's a long story, you know? <laughs> we, uh, we got time, because everybody <laughs> always has a story of why, you know, why they did. I had a buddy on a few weeks ago. Yeah. He was in college playing baseball, and he said, you know, it was just one of those, I don't know. So then, you know, everybody has a story of why they of why they did. Honestly, it was uh, seventh grade. Um, I, I knew I was going to go into the Marine Corps. Um, I went on this church retreat come back, my grandpa was passing away. Um, And he was so badly, you know, suffering that he was literally 95 pounds. He was a skeleton basically at that point. I came to go see him and he looked up at me, he could barely speak and he called me Tiger. And he said, Tiger, if you want to treat a woman with respect, I want you to go into the Marine Corps. Now he was in the army, so he already knew going to the Marine Corps kind of thing, right? Yeah. So he, he, that's, that's really what led me to it was, him just sitting there and saying, Tiger, I want you to join the Marine Corps. Um, that was the, one of the last conversations I had with him. And my grandpa, my other grandpa, he was in the Navy. So it was kind of one of those big things for me. It was, all right, I'm going to join the Marine Corps so we can have the Navy, the Army, then the Marine Corps, right? So for me, it was just that I wanted to follow in their footsteps. So you're well, seventh grade. How old are you at that time? Well, well, it's on. So, and then, and that, then that just stuck with you. And you know, everybody always has it. You know, I want to be. I think I want you know a bus driver when I'm a kid, right? You ride oh, the yeah. bus, and but it, it just that that just to come to you, and then for you to to stick with it, going through even in high school, and that was what it, you know, because you get into high school and the, yeah, the I, honest, I mean, a lot of people thought I wouldn't even do it. Um, I had a teacher that said, you're not even going to get a job at McDonald's because of how bad I was in high school, because I was so focused on the Marine Corps that I was forgetting about all my other goals. Right. So it going into the Marine Corps, it was being told you you can be dumb going into the Marine Corps. So my high school, it just, I didn't really pay attention. I didn't really focus on my academics. So I got in trouble with weed. I got in trouble with this, got in trouble, kept getting in trouble in high school just because I was like, all right, cool. I'm going to blow this off kind of thing. So you had you had direction, but you didn't have direction, Correct. really. Yeah, and and everybody. So you enlisted at eighteen, and you're and you're gone. So what? Two months after, a month after I turned eighteen. A month after you eighteen. So I had my my graduation from high school. I had my eighteenth birthday, and I had my going away party all in the same one. <laughs> So, and you weren't, you weren't really, were you an athlete growing up at all? Was yeah, I it, played football, um, football, baseball, wrestling, um, pretty much did it all. So I uh, played football for nine years. Really, that was really what my goal was, was to be in the NFL. So, or playing baseball. I mean, I was my first year in baseball. They were trying to draft me up because I was so quick. I could hit the ball. Literally, it just was natural to me. Sports, yeah. it's natural. Sports are even to this day. So, you know, you said you're going through high school, you were, 
wanting to be an a- athlete. You're from where? You're from Southern California, uh, Santa Maria, California, okay. Central Coast. Okay, so you, I mean, so you've got the weather for basically one year sport all year round, baseball oh, yeah. or football. But you want you want to do it all. Were you able to play? You said even though you weren't focused on your grades in school, or was it? So that was that was where it all really slipped up. Was I brought an ounce of weed to school, and I was on the football team, and literally it was summer school. I was trying to show off to people for some reason. Ended up getting the head coach walking in on summer school to pull me out because he was acting principal during summer school. (laughs) Right then I was booted right off the football team. So he walked in, he got word on it from another kid on the team, so on and so on. And literally that just completely changed my whole entire life. That changed everything. And I was like, man, this is, so I just started going down that path of smoke weed, smoke weed. I thought it was too cool. I was too cool for everything else. So what year was this in high school? Oh, three when I first got in trouble. So I graduated in 05 and then okay. I think 03. So you had a couple of years of just this downward. Yeah. And then getting to the Marine Corps and how long before you were in combat? Um, so I went into boot camp August 05 and then I went to boot camp for three months. And then literally I was in the fleet for about a year. Um, 2017, oh, 2017, 2007, I deployed to Iraq. So that first year and a half, I didn't do too good. I was only 125 pounds in the Marine Corps. So I was tiny. I was the little guy. I was the guy that everybody picked on, this and that. But I never did good in that. I didn't do good at drill. I did good at the sports, right? So combat was kind of my sports. That was where I actually thrived at was out in the field doing what i had to do focused on a mission at the end of the day and that's how that's why i thrived at sports too because you saw the you saw the end game of what it was right right? you knew that it was it didn't matter what it took Mm -hmm. so you had that that mindset to be able to carry you over to to that that sport mindset and you see you know i think that's why a lot of those maybe the guys that are come out even if they come out of the military you know softball guys that have played sport they're athletes that love to do it it wasn't as if you were bred from the time you were born to be yeah you don't i mean when I was in boot camp drill, I thought it was pointless. I was like, what is this teaching me, right? Okay, cool, I gotta throw a rifle around, this and that. It just wasn't exciting kind of thing. So once you put a weapon in my hand and I got actually the end goal, I gotta last eight hours on patrol. I gotta get back, right? I gotta get all my guys back, so on and so on. That was what my mission was. Fourth quarter, second quarter, third quarter, right? You got something in goal at the end of the day. And you were in charge of how many? You, I was never actually in charge. So I was um, I was a M16 gunner, and then I was a saw gunner over in Afghanistan. So my first year, I was a little guy. Literally, it was <laughs> my first year overseas. I was literally the little guy. So, um, and then Afghanistan, I basically became the second man on the team, kind of in charge. Not second man in charge but i was on the team right so uh saw gunner they always give the saw to the little guys and that thing is heavy too i don't think everybody realizes how heavy it is for a 125 pound guy (laughs) to be able to 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 maneuver and use the fire to to carry this this saw gun right and then 800 rounds on top of it and you're walking with it you got we got to remember that's 130 40 pounds right there with the flak jacket with everything else so i'm carrying basically double my weight on top of it by the time a patrol was over and you it's 130 degrees outside 120 degrees so we're dripping in sweat i'm losing weight i'm not gaining weight <laughs> over there. you were able, never able to put it on what's the biggest you got to then i think 130 130 134 i think it was um by the time i finally got out and was able to really put on something but i really didn't gain weight until after the military i mean i was a twig I was a twig in the military. <laughs> That's amazing, being especially having to carry that over up and down mountain, I mean, all over the place, right? So you were out on 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 uh, on your on duty or on your shifts or whatnot for, yep. for hours on end, carrying this stuff around. Oh yeah, and <laughs> running. So when you hear people complain about having to carry something fifty pounds I, up the I stairs, you up. just I crack up. But then also when I got out, I went on strike from working out. So I made it a mission to not work out. If somebody brought up any type of working out, I said, no, absolutely not. No, no. I went on literally strike. 
and then that's what I do now. <laughs> and that, that's that's funny. So you get, you said you get out in 2009, right? Yep, yep. And then leading, you know, so so after that you get out. How old were you? you 22. 22 years old. 22. With and so what do you what what's your first thought? You know, everybody we, we we you know talking about this, we you know, we've had this conversation on the phone about people they kind of their their identity, right? They don't have an identity. And I think that's, you know, where, you know, where this, where this conversation is heading as far as what do these guys do? Right. And it's, and I think that's where, so what, what was, what was your thought process as soon as you came out? I thought I had it figured out. <laughs> I did not have it figured out. Um, I actually moved to New Jersey. Um, so the day I got out, I drove from 29 Palms all the way to New Jersey. What what's in what's in New Jersey? I met I met a girl. She, okay, she broke up with me two days before I got there too. Um, so that's even worse. I had a jeep that was breaking down. I had, I mean, I had to start it from underneath the, the jeep and everything. The AC was blowing out smoke. I'm telling you, it was, it was a a mess driving out there. So she ended up breaking up with me two two days before I got out there, and I can laugh about it now. Um, but it's it's a lot, right? It You're was 20, a lot. 21? I had no bed. I had my dog and I had my uniforms and I had a couple pairs of clothes. That's all I had. And then I had $2,000 in my bank account. That's it. Right. Yeah. But then I got to put a security deposit down. Then I got to pay for food. Then I got to take care of my dog. I got to buy a bed. I got to buy this. I got to buy that. $2,000 isn't a lot when you're getting out. Right. But I thought because everything was so taken care of while I was in the Marine Corps, I thought $2,000 was a lot. I felt like I was rich almost, right? Is because food was taken care of, housing was taken care of, what to wear was taken care of, so on and so on. Yeah, that somebody taught us how to do a resume, but it wasn't the, I wasn't in the right mindset to go over that, right? So there's, you know, the organization for a week, you go in there. I'm sleeping halfway through that because why do I want to go through that? I want to get out. I want to go to college. I want to go party i want to go do what i gotta do i'm behind on the curve you know so my mindset's almost 18 years old all over again so the stuff you missed so ba- so you that's it so you you discharged um for the military and it's basically is it just here you go that's yep. all it was yep. at yep. 20 so 21 years old it's kind of i i remember literally going to this office to get this piece of paper and they were like bye have a good day and i was like i literally said what else do i need i don't know that was my exact response was i don't know you got to go figure this out. And I was just like, okay, all right, I'm leaving, right? So my address for my honorable discharge certificate wasn't right. Like nothing was right on there. Um, I had no idea what I was doing, where I was moving, right? I put on my the girlfriend that I had at the time, I put her parents' address down there, actually. Yeah. Um, so I never got my honorable discharge certificate because it was sent to them. They didn't like me afterwards. Um, so, you know, it was it was literally getting to this house and I met this uh, for a roommate. And I mean, my attitude, my behavior just wasn't healthy, right? I'm so used to the barracks that I had no idea how to even a- interact. I pushed so hard that she left my roommate yeah. and it was like, okay, cool. I'm sleeping in the living room on the floor, not knowing what I'm doing. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you're right. You, you you know nothing other than you had one mindset, and that was it. And all of a sudden, but is, I mean, have you? I mean, being out now, have, you, have a lot of former vets or the, a lot of vets had that same experience of basically, thanks, see ya. Not even a thanks. It's just yeah, you're on, good I, luck. I think they're getting a little bit better. However, at the same time, when your mindset's ready to get out, you're ready to get out. Yeah, you got no other purpose but to walk out those doors and take off that uniform. Because in our mindsets is we can have so many organizations, we can have this, we can have that. But the mindset is just, I want to go back home. I want to go do this. I want to go do that. That's what you're focused on when you're getting out. Now, I'll speak on f- for myself. That's what I was focused on. I can tell you the people I've talked to, they're just ready. They're ready to go out. Now, there's the people, individuals that maybe served for 10, 15, 20 years that their mind is a little bit you know, established or they started working on things other than the military because their mind's ready then they got to see the transition from their buddies as well too so and um, so you getting out and all this you know living on the couch and when did it finally hit you that uh, i've got to f- 
somebody's going to help me. I we need to finally hit you. I've got to figure this out. Did, did somebody come say, say, hey, Denver, you got to be, you got to do this? Or was it just you had an epiphany one day of, man, this is not what it is. I've got to figure this out. You know, it took a very long time um, for me to recognize it. Very long time. And in between that, I had somebody coming out to me saying, you need to write a book. You need to do this. You need to do that. At a moment where in New Jersey, what brought me back to California actually was I was in New Jersey and I threw a dude out the window, basically. <laughs> um, second story, luckily there was a little awning right there, but everybody and we were having a party, but that was my lifestyle was I was working at Buffalo Wild Wings. I would literally go to work to get a keg the next day because I wanted everybody around me. I felt like I was feeding off of that kind of side of things. Everybody would text me, hit me up and say, are we doing a keg this weekend? Yes, let me go to work real quick. That was my lifestyle for a very long time, was party, do this, do that. And then threw the dude out because he called me a name. I don't know if I can say that on here, but- You can say um, whatever you want, it's an unscripted, he, you know, he, he literally called me a bitch. Yeah. And my whole body, my whole demeanor just completely changed. And I grabbed him and I just threw him. And I said, and my face and everybody's faces, there was about 30 people with me and they all put their hands up, went directly to that guy. It was like the movie that you see, right? Is I was protecting myself. That's what I thought, but everybody ran from me. Then they started saying, I'm scared of you. And that still didn't wake me up. I still went and had a party the next week, but nobody showed up. They're afraid of a 125 pound man at this point. I was a little bit bigger. I was about 135 (laughs) at that time, you know? Yeah. But I still had the mentality of war, of like, I'm fighting. You call me a name. I'm going to do what I got to do to take Mm -hmm. care of me. And the next week, I realized everybody was afraid of me. There was like four people that showed up. And that was a moment. And it was random people that never really showed up. And then, so that turned into me losing my place that i was staying at because the owner lived at the house saw that Mm -hmm. i broke the window he said you got 30 days to get out um i started scrambling over in jersey basically long story short i went over to santa barbara after that and that's when i actually found the love of my life cocaine um cocaine was my best friend for about two and a half three years um that literally ran me dry that ran me i was working to literally provide for cocaine um, if I drink one sip of alcohol, I was running to go find my dealer and go, I was my dealer's best friend at that point. <laughs> we had a, we had a meetup spot. We had everything. Um, but I was keeping it together for the most part until it just kind of blew up at me. How old were you at this point? So you, so we can see you drove to New Jersey, you're there and you drive all the way back. Yep. Right. So this is just, how old are you at this time? 25, I want to say 25, 26, somewhere around there. Um, maybe, yeah, I think so. 25, 26. Yeah. So this trends could, you know, he's, he's talking about just, it's continuing and, and you saw, you said, knowing it started in high school, right? You thought you, yeah. what you were doing is right. And this is, like you said, this is your, your out, your, your release point is, is, is the cocaine and stuff. So you're at, so you're at this point now doing, yeah. doing all this stuff. And then is this, how long does this continue through? That was two and a half years. Um, Ended up attempting suicide for the first time. Um, actually stood on a bridge. I was so depressed, drinking alcohol, cocaine, this and that. And then they, that was the first time in Santa Barbara I actually punched a cop because I was so out of my mind. Luckily, he wasn't in uniform, and luckily, he was a veteran himself. That was the moment that he was like, all right, cool. I'm taking you to the VA. That was a nice little $5,000 bill right there. But, you know... I was grateful for him at that point. Um, honestly, I lost my my house that I was living in. I lost everything in Santa Barbara during that three years. I just went down it. And at the VA, at the psych ward, they actually said, you're an addict. And I was like, no, I'm not. I fought it. I was I was fighting it because all I wanted to do was leave and go and use, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Long story short, basically, I had to admit that I was an addict. That's when they finally released me and they put me into a rehab. Mm -hmm. Uh, for the cocaine use, all that good stuff. And I was like, all right. Did you admit it just to make, to get out? I admitted it it just to get out. Okay. Um, That was the moment that, because I was still trying to manipulate. Mm -hmm. I was still trying to do what I could 
to get away from there. Mm -hmm. Um, so I got out, went to rehab and I was like, all right, I'm just going to do it. I already lost my, my home. They already packed up all my stuff within two weeks. They had everything out of my, my room that I was renting in mm -hmm. Santa Barbara and I was clean and sober. I was doing what I had to do for two and a half years. Uh, I'm sorry, about a year and a half. And then I got dis or disability from, you know, military, basically. I, I didn't put it in. I went, checked myself into a sober living, checked myself into doing what I had to do at that point, And I got a back pay check of $134,000. You don't do that to somebody that's basically homeless. Yeah. You can't do that. Mentally, you can't. I went and dropped $36,000 the very next day. I went and dropped $5,000 on strippers. I went and bought $1,000 worth of Red Bulls and rock stars because guess what? I have no responsibilities at this point. I'm living in this home. I don't have a job. I don't have anything. Dropping it. I was dropping money like it was cool. And I was trying to buy people's love at that point. So what do I do? I start going into old behaviors, basically. Mm. You know? Moved out of that place when it said I can do this on my own. Went and found that cocaine all over again, you know, and just found it. Um, yeah, and then that led me to my last time that literally just killed me, literally. <laughs> so, yeah. oh, was it? You said talking about the, you know commit suicide. What was was it? Oh, was it just the drugs and overdose, or what was it? What you know, it, it's it's so. It led to me actually that back pay check. I was paying for everybody's stuff. Mm -hmm. and I went and blew that within eight months, but I found what I had to find again. And I thought buying people's love, I was moving people into the apartment that I ended up paying a year for. And I was like, don't worry about food. Don't worry about this. I got it. I got everything. The military mindset, you know? taking care of everybody, right? Taking care yeah. of them. Didn't realize that money's not cheap i'm over there buying arcade things i mean things that financially i couldn't afford <laughs> yeah. you know i i put it nothing in, in savings nothing so uh my apartment became the party hit place again right people i mean this little tiny two bedroom i had like 30 people in one time downstairs neighbors did not like me they're like banging on all this kind of stuff and I don't know what I was thinking. This was in Los Angeles too. It was in Tarzana, Tarzana California, or Texas. Yeah, California. Yep. Um, and I just, I don't know. I got in a fight with the roommate at one point. I was like, man, you got to start paying rent. You know, how about $200 a month? My rent's like $3,000. Yeah. He's like, okay, 200, here you go. Like, done. And that actually led me to feeling depressed because now I'm not satisfied. I'm not happy. How do I go to somebody and say, all right, you've been living rent free. I need you to step up this and that, you know, we ended up getting in a fist fight, ended up going out, getting really depressed, getting that cocaine again, attempted the suicide, stayed up all night, stayed up all night. My mind's just completely shot. I grab an 18 pack, go to the store, grab all the pills that the VA gave me as well. No offense to the VA. I love them. Nowadays I do. Um, but I had a bottle this big, literally about three, four inches of, of pills all mixed together. And I started chugging them, like chugging them like candy and grabbing the, the beer, chugging it there. And I started driving, call up my sister and I'm like, all right, I'm coming, I'm coming to you. And she's in my hometown still. And she's like, what are you, what are you doing? What are you talking about? You can't drive right now. I was like, no, I'm coming. I need to see you before I die. And that was what I kept saying to my sister. Um, Ended up getting from Tarzana to El Capitan State Beach. And El Capitan State Beach, I ended up jumping out of the truck, passing out on the side, passing away for a couple minutes. Two surfers actually were the ones that found me. Um, they're the ones that found me. They called the police, they did that. But my sister was on the line too with some of her friends because now I'm in her area. Yeah. I'm now in Santa Barbara County, which she knows that area. And she luckily had the police already knew where I was. They already knew everything. So within the two servers finding me, the police were right behind me, right behind them kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So they ended up taking me to the hospital. I was already done. I was already tapped out. And they released me from the hospital 12 hours later. Nothing. No questions. Nothing. No. 
they knew. And I was asking them, please take me to the VA. That's where I need to go. They said, nope, we have no resources to take you to the VA. I said, well, then link me with somebody. Put me in somewhere. I need something, you know? And they released me. But then I also manipulated them, too. I said, hey, I got a ride. I got this. I got that. They literally said, oh, your ride's here? Have a good day. No checkout. No nothing. Nothing. I just walked out of the, the hospital, cottage hospital. Like <laughs> It was nothing. So I turned around, and I basically sat there, and I said, I can't do this. This isn't fair. I had about 60 people call me. I had people... I mean, people I haven't talked to in years calling me, reaching out. I took a picture and put it on my group, on my 2nd Battalion, 7th Marines group, and of all the pills in my mouth even. Oh, really? And, I mean, that was me. I need help, you know? And people were reaching out to me. They We were stressing them out. And mind you, we lost quite a bit of guys to suicide as well with my unit. Um, we're at 56 right now, so... Um, it was the domino effect on top of it, right? Mm -hmm. So when you lose one guy, your mind's just like, okay, cool, they're gone. I could be gone as well. Mm -hmm. So that was where my mindset was really at, is I'm tired, I'm tired of the chase, this and that, you know? So basically, yeah, I checked myself into the home that I was already in with 48 Iraq and Afghanistan veterans. And I walk in and I changed that whole entire house. I changed my, the way I was living but I knew that I needed to do it for me, right? Is when Santa Barbara Cottage Hospital released me 12 hours later, I said, this is bull. This is bullshit. Yep. Flat out, like, we got to help each other out. Like, if other hospitals are doing this and they're not educated on this, what are we going to do? So I went into this home, and I mean, it just completely changed my whole entire life. Just walking in and seeing those guys of knowing that, right, it seems like from the, from the beginning that you've been asking in a you know indirect way of hey i need help but nobody's really wanting to wanting to help and they're just to say it's kind of it's almost like they're just brushing you off here you go and yeah you don't know how to do it too you know i mean they don't know how to help mm -hmm. especially from a distance yeah i mean it's and that's and i think until you've been through it just in that hell hole that you don't you don't know how to until you've been around it, and I think that was your moment of when you walked in there. Of, Wait, I'm in. I've been in this hole, and I see these guys, and knowing what do I need to do then to be able to help them? Because yep. I don't like you said the amount of guys that you're losing. You know, the, I know 22 kills a big one of the big ones yep. around here as far as the, you know the suicide rate and stuff between with veterans and seeing that. So you you walk into that into that the house, and once you you, you start getting figuring it out what what's your, what was your next play from that moment so this is in california still right so you're yeah. still there yep um it was depressing walking into that house it was sad how old were you this time um eight years ago so <laughs> um how old am i now 20 27 okay 28 somewhere around there. gotcha so you're so you've grown so you grew up you basically grew up almost yep. instantaneously after that your 25 yep. years of stupidity whatever yep. you call it now yep. wait it just i grew up so I felt like it was a, there was a lot of crutches, right? Um, everybody was in, mind you, I'm, I'm friends with a lot of them still, you know, but a lot of them walk into that house just to get their disability or putting on that, that show. And then I'm sitting here like, all right, I've done two tours and you've done one and then you were on a plane. Like, cool, buddy. Like your PTSD is real, right? Or... They're hiding out in their room, isolating, right? Playing their video games all day long, not going to groups, not actually doing their best practices. Mm -hmm. Or I watched individuals go in there because they were court ordered to go in there, right? Or they walked in just to do it and then walk out. And then two months later, you see them inside the lobby and they're all strung out on heroin or whatever it might be. And I think for me, it was walking in that house and I said, I don't want to be this statistic. I don't want to be this person. This is sad. Like it was, it was sad to see a lot of those individuals. Like there was a handful of people I never saw. It's like, are they even okay in their rooms? Kind of thing. Um, so I walked into this house and I just said, I'm, I'm changing how I live. Um, I'm going to go to all these groups that they provide. I'm going to learn about codependency. I'm going to learn about meditation. I still don't like meditation. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
I want to learn, right? I yeah. want to learn about this stuff because maybe what I've been doing hasn't been helpful. Maybe me not working out hasn't been helpful, you know, and that's, that's how I walked in that house. But I was, you can almost imagine almost like prison in a way. Um, you get a leader, you get somebody that's, you know, the, the reps and so on and so on. And I walked in there and I really sat there and I said, I'm, we're not doing this. Like, we're not doing this anymore. We're going to go and do a healthy living now kind of thing. Don't get me wrong. I still ate like shit, but, yeah. um, we started going on hikes to the Hollywood sign hike. That was right up the street kind of thing. We did 14 mile hikes. We did working out, so on and so on. They had a beautiful gym there, for instance, you know? And so I just completely changed my whole lifestyle walking in there. So that, that brings us to, to now. So you're living here in Texas now. Is that, so what you were starting, what you were doing there, what made you decide to come to Texas? Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I've been, so I'll start here is I met a guy named Nate Boyer. He's all right. You know, he's a Seattle Seahawk Green Bray. And he actually walked into that house. Um, I was not happy with him. I was, I was really angry with him walking in. It was about two months after I got in that house. I just got back from a 14 mile hike with a bunch of guys <clears throat> and I'm sitting on this patio and this guy comes in and starts just taking pictures. I'm like, what, what's going on? And he sees my face. I see him walk out. <laughs> I literally, I go chasing after him. Like, what are you doing? He's like, Oh, I'm here with DSP. And I was like, I don't give a fuck. <laughs> I was like, I, I'm not a charity case. I was like, what are you really doing here? He's like, oh, yeah, so ESPN, here's a card. And I was like, I really don't care, dude. You still didn't, like, he still didn't answer your question. Like, yeah. I really don't care. Who are you? He's like, oh, I'm Nate Boyer. And I was like, I really don't care. <laughs> I really don't care. I'm not a charity case. And he looked at me, smiled. He's like, I really like you. And I was like, yeah, well, you need to get the fuck out of my house. Um, and everybody was like, yeah, you know, and. So he ended up taking off and then somebody posted an article on him that night on like Facebook. And I was like, Oh dude, I'm an idiot. Right. Because somebody like a, a Nate Boyer can be a mentor to myself. Right. So mind you in this mindset, I'm, I'm done. I'm done challenging everybody and I'm down to start listening to tell me, tell me what I need to do to fix myself now at this point. So that was kind of the whole, Thing was ended up reaching out to Nate. Did you know he did he tell you he was an NFL former NFL player? No, he he didn't no. say we're just I'm gonna I didn't, I didn't even give him a chance. Oh, you didn't. You I just didn't told him you just chance. wanted to get the hell out. Yeah. Don't take a picture of me. Like, you know, and I'm trying to better my life. I'm not a charity case, so on and so on. And looking at him, did he he didn't say anything about military either? Nothing. Just I you know, I can't recall. You're probably too pissed I, off at the yeah, moment. I, yeah, I can't recall all I remember. Ask is, Nate that question. I remember see. seeing the guy snapping the photos, you know, right to his mm-hmm. chest, and it was like No. Yeah. Like get out. That's all I cared about at that point was don't take a picture of me. I'm I just did a fourteen mile hike. Why didn't you do that fourteen mile hike with me? Kind of thing. Yeah. Um so I wasn't happy with it. And you know, he told me I'll, I'll talk to you and that night, I literally sent him an email, and I was like, I'm so sorry about that. I think I still got the email, too, somewhere. But I just sat there. I was like, you know, I've been looking for a mentor. I think you could actually help me out. <coughs> and he's like, let's sit down next week. Let's do lunch. Um, went and met up with them, had lunch with them, and told me about the idea of merging combat veterans and former athletes together. And I didn't like the idea at first. Why? Well, I didn't think that athletes could actually relate with the combat veterans. I didn't know that they could, they couldn't. Right. I didn't understand what it was like for an athlete to have their uniform stripped from them as well. You know, I didn't understand that part. All I understood was wars. That's what I understood. I didn't understand like somebody could get injured and somebody could be so depressed and you know, you think that you're doing your life term or this or that. And then next thing you know, you've got nothing. You know, so I've had to do a lot of history over the last seven years learning about it. So, which is good, educating yourself in the in the process. Absolutely, absolutely. So you, so you meet Nate, and it brings you to, you know, to where we are today. So you're you're living here. You live in in Aubrey, right? It started you and Nate started this the MVP group, right? The, the 
Uh, Jay, Jay and Nate started it. Jay and Nate started this. So Jay, okay. Jay Glazer, Fox NFL mm-hmm. Insider, um, wrote a book. Amazing individual. He, uh, him and Nate actually started it by a conversation with literally they were inside of his living room and they both walked off two different phone calls and a veteran was struggling and an athlete was struggling. They came together. They were like, what happened? You know, and they started talking about it and they said, let's put them together. Let's do that. And they only did one session before I walked in the door. <laughs> and then that's where this convert, that's where this, this started. So this is, you're still in, still in Southern California, in California at this time, right? Yep. Starting this MVP type thing. So how's it, so you get this, this, this going, what, what was the conversation like? Hey, we need to, or was it, because like you said, you said you were still kind of didn't, didn't see the athlete military, no. you know, the, the correlation there with, with what they go through. Um, so the very first session that we, we technically really had was I walked in there with eight guys from that, that transitional housing walked in and we were so just like, what is going on? We're over here. Jerry Farrar is working out. Demi Lovato is working out. I'm like, I'm wearing hand-me-down clothes at this point, you know? And I go to meet Jay, and I had no idea who Jay was. I've only seen him on Fox. Mm -hmm. And so I'm shaking. I'm like, whoa, what is going on? But then there's Jay. There's Randy Couture also, too. And Randy actually stayed for the workout to sit down. I didn't trust Jay. I didn't trust Randy. I had no idea. But then after that first session, I got a couple things off my chest, right? I was able to do that workout. I felt good about that workout. I'm like laying down on this bag, only eight of us. And then Randy Katoro is over there and he's talking about how he was in the army. And then he went and became a UFC fighter. And then he's talking about how it actually became, he wasn't supposed to fight in his first fight. You know, they called him up a couple days before and they said, come on, we got a spot for you. He wasn't even supposed to do that first fight, for instance. Um, And learning about those kind of things of the chances of this and and that. So that first session, I was like, I like this. This is cool. I feel safe. I just feel a little bit more vulnerable. I feel a little bit more relaxed after the workout, you know? And so we sat there and we just did what we had to do. And Jay was like, hey, let's do this again next week. And it was like, okay. Brought two more guys in. He's like, hey, let's do it again next week. And it just kept pushing. And then he was like, hey, not the same guys have to come. I want to pack this room. Yeah. And so I just sat there and I was like, all right, let me go start telling these guys at the house. And I started telling the guys at the house, but then I started meeting people outside of everything too. Mm -hmm. And then I was rekindling relationships with my two seven guys. I was doing all that. So ended up bringing other people in and we just started packing that room jay was kind of bringing in the athletes nate was bringing in the athletes and then i was bringing in the veterans so that's kind of how it formed was for about a year or so i just kept bringing people in then at one point we had like 75 people inside this unbreakable gym in in hollywood and that was he pulled me up and he's like we're gonna hire you and mind you i'm volunteering like i'm literally because I just believed in it. Mm-hmm. And he noticed that there was more, more at that point. So for the year, volunteered, and then we opened up Vegas at Randy Couture's gym because Randy went back to Vegas, and he's like, I miss this when he wasn't in L.A. So we opened up LA, or Vegas, and then so we had like two chapters for about three years, uh, three and a half years, and then all of a sudden we're opening up Chicago. And then all of a sudden we're opening up Seattle and Atlanta and this and that. And I'm just like, whoa. Um, so we started building out our staff, started doing what we had to do. <laughs> and you ended up, so, and so what, when did you get to Texas finally? I got to Texas a year and a half ago. Um, so we opened up a chapter out here. I was kind of the, you know, Dan Quinn, he's a big supporter of opening up Atlanta chapter, right? Mm-hmm. So. Dan Quinn and Mike McCarthy. Mike McCarthy is responsible for getting one of my coworkers on. Um, and they said, hey, I want to bring him on, so on and so on. So then you got Mike McCarthy out here. Then you got Dan Quinn out here. And so we were like, you know what? It's perfect. It's a no-brainer. We need to open up for them. It's not just for them, but for us too. Um, Dan, 
DQ and uh, Mike McCarthy both said, hey, let's do it. Let's open it up out there in Dallas. And I said, please, I need to go. My parents live in McKinney. And I said, I got to go. That's part of my journey is getting closer with my family all over again. Little did I know my older sister was moving out to Texas. My little sister already lives in Texas. And then my parents live in McKinney. So I'm like, all right, I got to do this. And they gave me another job promotion saying you can move wherever you want. And I said, I'm moving to Texas. I need to be with my family. And it's part of my journey. And it's not because I want to. It's because I need to at this point. Yeah, the healing process, yep. right, of what, yep. you're, what, you're, what you, you're going through. So now, so how many members now are part of this Dallas-Fort Worth chapter? Dallas, we have grown up to 200 members already in one year. Um, so we, Dallas chapter is, is 200. We started with eight, eight members in L.A., and now we're up to 1,700 members right now total throughout all of our chapters. And you're trying to, and you're creating these in these major sports hub cities because right because of the of the of the mvp what you're doing you know you're building one in houston i know is, Sl is slade the one that's running that one uh slade's over he's in chicago area right now okay uh we are looking at austin maybe okay um i know we want to do a little bit more too um a lot of it has to do with funding to be mm -hmm. honest with you funding's a big part is we want to make sure that we have funding for at least five to six years out before we do open up too. Gotcha, and it helps with those the athletes that stay in the area to be able to um, to do this. You want to explain to them what what these the the thought process of the workouts? Or are they more military based workouts? Or are they more sports area work? Or are they a combination of where you're throwing on a, a, a sack and you're running for twenty miles? You know, it depends. It depends on the chapter. To be honest, each chapter has its own um, identity, almost right. Every chapter has its own autonomy to kind of build what they want to build but we like to do buddy teams that's the number one that we really like to do when it comes to the workout and we don't want to kill somebody either because every every person's walking in at a different level right yeah. so an athlete may be a lot better in shape than me for instance when i first walked in there an athlete might be saying 45 minutes isn't enough for me i need an extra 30 minutes on my workout mm -hmm. right so then we got individuals that come in that are wanting to lose a lot of weight too because they haven't worked out. I had a gentleman come in and he said, I haven't worked out since 1996. And he was a former athlete, right? Um, so you don't know where they're coming in at. So that workout is meant to be a buddy team so that way we can pair each other up, encourage one another to push yourself, but then also it's just to get that blood, sweat, and tears kind of you know, not blood. The fellowship that comes with it, right? Yeah, you know, of, of just to kind of get, yeah. get it going a little bit, you know, is we don't want to kill somebody. At the end of the day, we want to encourage somebody to come back the next week as well, and they know that they accomplished that one workout through the week. Right, and being able to, and you never know how many, it's somebody's life that is changing, right? Because, you, like you said, you were afraid to really, you wanted people around, but you didn't know how to ask for help. Maybe this is this is helping people to say, you know, they're working, hey, Denver, you know, I'm dealing with some, hey, perfect. You know, I yep. can help you. I've been there doing that. As, and that maybe that's the outlet they, that they need, right? Sometimes it just takes a little bit to get them to finally just say. I've watched so many people come through the room and they start tearing up during that workout. Really? Or they go extra hard certain weeks. And we can pull them off to the side and we can have a little conversation with them and say, hey, is everything okay? How's the wife? How's the husband doing? Like, what's going on with you and we can pull them off to the side and we can see that emotion so many times i hear it from personal trainers of man i'm a therapist at the end of the day like so many people open up to me and talk to me and we get a chance to actually be as a peer i'm not a therapist i'm not but i can see when somebody is you know going through a little something but we want to encourage that they can finish so a lot of times during that workout it's like hey come on I'm going to link you up with this person, right? Or we'll switch their partners or whatever it might be. Maybe they need a certain something switched up. So we'll go to the trainers and say, hey, which we have some amazing trainers here in the DFW area um, at Adaptive Training Foundation. They are amazing what they do. Um, we got a couple of amputees that help us out. So if they can do it, we can do it. And that's always what we kind of say too is let's push it. So the, so the group, the MVP groups, or whatever they are, their chapters, are they able to 
you know, I'm sure you do, and I know you guys done your work of saying, hey, if somebody at this chapter needs some help, you guys have the people that they can go to and say, hey, this guy's having so it's people that you guys have vetted, not just some random person, right? Because yeah. you, you really want somebody that's probably been through it. I mean, I mean, I guess the ideal would be some military background that's that's a therapist that understands it to be able to help. So, you know, I mean, is that is that how you guys each chapter is? Or somebody there that they is that part so of we, the process? So we do a lot of peer to peer, but then we also have a clinical director on staff too. Okay. Um, so we have a clinical director that's literally on speed dial, a lot quicker than a lot of appointments. At the end of the day, she has almost 50 years of experience, maybe a little bit less. Um, I'm not going to put out her age. Love you, Susie. Um, (laughs) uh, She's GMA at the end of the day, right? So she's, she's a licensed clinician, but she's a coach, right? And she won't say that I'm a a therapist. She won't say that, but she's going to coach us up to being, getting to the next level, right? She does focus on like childhood trauma, so on and so on. So it actually pulls out a lot in us which she is probably one of the most she's an amazing individual when if if anybody worked with her they will sit back and say she's amazing so she does help out every chapter she does she's on speed dial she's text message away she's a phone call away i call her if she can't answer she'll call me back in two minutes kind of thing Uh, she does that for all of our members at the end of the day she is based in los angeles um, but then she knows, you know, there's a lot of things that I've already been certified into myself, peer to peer support, suicide prevention, CPR, you know, so I've gone through a lot of these courses as well to be able to handle a lot of situations that may arise at the end of the day. Yeah. She's, and you, you're getting phone calls probably at all hours of the day. It's not as if she's just only certain work in certain hours because of what, you know, so you, so you're out in the communities seeing these people. I mean, more and more people are starting to hear about MVP and wanting to join, right. Wanting to say, Hey, I want to be a part can I be, I want to, how can I even just even donations as well. You guys take yeah. donate for the, for each chapter Absolutely. to be able to, to get out. I mean, it's, you know, a lot of these guys coming back, you know, talk about the amputees, those guys, you know, Walter Reed the hospital here of, of saying, Hey guys, this, I mean, are you guys, is the military, spearheading and helping you guys to so when these guys come home or saying here if you need it here's here's these guys here's you know here's the chapter and wherever i mean are they helping we're, we're working on something with that we are still a fairly new nonprofit too right mm-hmm. so we are still very new but we've expanded so quick yeah uh, we're we've expanded one of the quickest organizations that are out there uh we're we're basically in that next year like we're going over that hump kind of thing to be really big uh we've been talking to the va we've been talking to uh nfl legends for instance we've been talking to mlb uh alumni so on so on because we want to be that resource but we also want to be exact resources for the athletes that we are with the veterans too um so a lot of the chapters they build out their local resources right so we are working on trying to get to that next level right now uh we're about to get to that like big step kind mm-hmm. of thing we got some things in the works of course um but we're we're definitely working with a lot of people because we do understand i will say this too is i've seen a lot of individuals come out and maybe they're in their first three four months and a lot of times they're not ready mm-hmm. right they're in that mindset of hold on you know so that's why I work with a lot of the individuals that have been out for three, four years, you know, um, people that have been doing 10 to 15 years in the military, so on and so on, or the athletes that have been out for quite some time as well, or the one to three year athletes too. To be able to just that, that focus, like you said, of giving them something to rely on. Right. Yep. And you've, and like I said, you've seen them from, from how they are coming out. You just even looking at somebody and they're calling you and telling you something. Have you had that conversation to say, look, you're, you're not ready for this part of it, but still being able to, to help. Yeah. I, I've done that actually a handful of times when I first moved out here. Um, I went in Frisco PD actually called me up and said, Hey, can you jump over here and, and help out a veteran? And I walked in there and you know, he was, he was pretty, pretty bad. And even Frisco PD, they trusted me to go and walk in and, and take care of this veteran as a peer. Yeah. Because that's what this gentleman needed at that point was a peer. Um, and he started coming into MVP. And he, you know, he relapsed actually a couple weeks later and I sat there and said, hey, you'll come in when you're ready to come in. Right. Yeah. 
door is always open for you. But the the drugs and things like that, we can't have that here. Yep. This isn't the the spot for it. And I'm sorry, we just can't do that. So we had another individual, you know, drinking in the parking lot. I'm sorry, we can't be here. Like yep. there's a lot of individuals in sobriety or so on and so on. We're trying to promote the healthy living. Mm -hmm. And we want to make sure that everybody's safe at the end of the day. Yeah. And, they, and I'm sure, do they respect you for that? Or was they kind of give what the attitude you had of just, you know, basically get the hell out of here. I don't they, want to. You know, typically there's a lot of times, but then I sit back and, and I wait. I wait for them to come to me and say, hey, I'm ready. Cool. Awesome. Doors open. When do you want to come in? Do you need a ride? That's what I will always say is, do you need a ride? Because I won't ever let somebody go and go down because I understand what it's like to be in that moment. And if somebody still called me up and said, hey, I love you, I miss you, cool, what's up, what you got? You know, the sessions may not be ready for them to walk in that door, and that's okay. But I'm going to be ready to answer that call. I'm going to be ready. And it doesn't have to be just me that reaches out. The phone works both ways at the end of the day, too. Yeah, and, and respect you enough to be able to say it. I am ready, and then and then putting in the work because of, and it's that no man left behind, right? That's the, that's the idea that these guys were able to see and, and understand and feel, but it gives them, like you said, that sense of identity, right? Because I'm sure you've heard people probably said the worst things possible to you, and you know, you just sit there and would probably just smile, right? Because, hey, I've been there. I know what you're going through, and I, hey, oh, yeah. I, I, would, I would have done the same thing to you <laughs> when I was 25 years old, right? Oh, yeah. But I'm beyond this, and do they... You know, and I'm sure they do get pissed off and just don't want to come come back. But you get, I've hey, had man. to do it twice. Yeah, you know, for myself personally, mm -hmm. um, without involving anybody else. But it's it's, I've had to do it, and it's it hurts. It's probably one of the worst conversations I can have. I don't like it, but they understand it at the end of the day. Yeah, I get some choice words, <laughs> you know, and it's okay. I'm I'm ready for it. I'm prepped for it. But I, I'll tell you, my anxiety is going when I got to have those conversations. So. <laughs> I'm sure, but you're 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 probably a lot better prepared than you would have oh, been yeah. because, like you said oh, before, yeah. you wouldn't have given somebody the time of day. It would have just been. Nope. Now it's just kind of you say you don't like the therapy, but you're I'm able to just woosa it out right and be, <laughs> re and be ready to go. Oh yeah. So you know, so so the, this program's created, and you know, we we'll get to this point now of. So Nate and all this, how does this this come out to wanting to take this further than just MVP the workout to where we're heading to here in the next few weeks? Yeah, so uh, Nate made a movie. <laughs> <laughs> was it was it one of those just to come to you and say, "Hey, we're this is what I want to do," or was it? I, I had no idea, honestly. Um, he just came through and he was like, "Here, read this script. It's a uh, part of your story and another person's story put together." And I was I hadn't. I don't, I don't like reading. Let's just be real. <laughs> Can you, um, is it on tape, please? <laughs> it, it's, you know, it's, he sends this script and I've never wanted to be in front of cameras. I've never wanted to read a script. And I'm over here like, what? I don't even know how to do it. Because then you're also playing people's parts. And, this, and I'm like, no, I'm not reading this. So um he sent it to me the first time and then he's like what'd you think i was like oh it was great man <laughs> <laughs> you tell the truth <laughs> and he's like you didn't read it did you i was like no i, I didn't man. <laughs> like no <laughs> so um he's like dude i really need you to read it i was like okay uh, and then like three months later i'm like can you send me that script again <laughs> <laughs> He's like, you really didn't read it? I was like, no, dude, like never once. So during that whole time, he kept sending it, and he was like, <laughs> I, delete, need, I need delete. input on this. And I'm like, dude, I don't know how to read a script. And I told him that flat out. I was like, I don't know how to read a script. You're saying one person's name here. Do I read the person's name? Do I do this? Like, I can't do a monologue inside my own brain. Like, it, it just doesn't work that way. One day I, I pulled over my girlfriend and I was like, hey, can you help me <laughs> with this? She's like, I don't know how to do this. So we just kind of pushed it off to the side. And then um, Nate basically came back and he was like, how many for this? How many for that? He started asking me like little questions kind of to get everything <clears throat> right for him to actually play the part on this, on this movie. And uh, during COVID, he actually started filming it like they had bunch of people reading the script so i was like you don't even need me bro like i'm gonna look at this script and i'm not even gonna know what i'm talking about so um he just kept asking questions it's kind of 
It's like it's it's a handful of us all combined, right? Yeah. Um, but it does start. The movie does start with with the gentleman on the beach, for instance. Um, yeah. Laying down, two surfers come up, grab him, um, and then it's made at my transitional housing as well. Um, it's made in one of the rooms that we were had. We called it the par- the barracks, actually. Yeah. So called it that. That place was actually shutting down. So Nate actually had full reign of this whole entire building. Um, so the gym was involved, just everything was involved in it. And then um, the gym at the transitional housing and then Unbreakable Performance as well. And then it showed kind of him going through and saying, hey, you coming to the gym tonight? You coming to the gym? You know, kind of the little things that I was kind of doing. Um, of course, a little bit of Hollywood as well. Um, but then there is a storyline of somebody not wanting to go back and see see mom right or being scared to go go back home that was me but then it was more of my coworker in it right mm-hmm. is i didn't want to face the music but then he really didn't want to go back home yeah. and then we kind of helped guide in the right direction of like dude you're going home man you're going home you're going home so it was a lot of our stories all kind of combined uh just watching this transitional housing and then my face is like oh i remember that house i remember that room <laughs> you know so it was it was a pretty cool thing to see this being made out did you give nate a hard time saying that's not what i how would i would have said it you know no, you know what i mean as um, far as no. you always see it they you said they hollywood the i gotta movie say up. he was pretty on point um you know i we just watched it this last week we had a handful of athletes that came down to uh dallas theater and we watched it um and I got to say that he was really on point. He put himself really into character. And it was a lot of good jokes towards the Air Force. So um, I give him props <laughs> for that one. <laughs> TK um, might not like that one. I'm <laughs> just saying, you know, he, he's already seen it. So, uh, <laughs> no, it's it's one of those things that I think it's he really did a really good job, especially, express, especially portraying how a family member should see a veteran or an athlete and it really focuses a lot on the athletes transition um the gentleman mo he did amazing in this he really brought this movie together and it shows him getting cut from the chargers right from athlete and he's just laying in bed and then showing up at home and it's like where do the dishes go and wife's over there like you're getting hot you really don't know where where the dishes go do you right and it really portrays really what an athlete and a veteran goes through on a day-to-day basis, coming back home and trying to reintegrate kind of side of things. So, yes, you know, Nate handed you the script. And <laughs> who is – so who came up with the idea? Was it Nate that had the idea that was with the script and took it to – to so Sylvester Stallone is one who produced yeah. this movie, right? Yeah. Is he the one – so Nate took it to Stallone and said, hey, is this – something you want to do or how was it did he even have did, i mean first of all they ask you for permission hey we want to do a story yeah part I, about I, you I, he and knew he already knew okay um i was in that mindset of sharing the sharing my story and i think i even brought it up like somebody should actually do this you know and you know i was happy for it at the end of the day it's as long as it helps one person out that's all i care about and then how sylvester got in, involved he was working out at unbreakable performance um and huge supporter um of mvp of the mission and i had to share my story in front and sylvester's face was just like wow you know uh jay he really helped me out sharing my story there was a lot of times that we'd have cameras inside a session or, or whatnot we don't do that really in dfw we may have warrant offs or so but um he was in there it was the night that i got hired on actually and it's funny because I have live for nothing on my live for nothing, die for something on my chest. And I went up to Sylvester. I was like, you don't understand. I got your tattoo on my chest. So on and so on, you know, and um, he that was the night that I got hired and Sylvester heard my story and he heard what I've been going through and how that transition was. And Jay really helped me out sharing my story of like, hey, you're going 10 minutes, bro. Like, slow it down. Take a break, you know, and. There was a moment that I was sharing my story for like 20 minutes at one point. And he's like, all right, we're going to drop your story down to three minutes, you know, and I've gotten to a point where I can share my story in three minutes if I wanted to. Um, But Sylvester was in there. He heard the story. He heard Nate. I went into the back room, talked to Sylvester, and then Nate was like, dude, would you mind? 
helping us out with this. He's like, absolutely, 100%. So Nate just went and sat down with them, had a nice little dinner with them or whatever he did. And Sylvester's like, cool, I want to jump behind this. This is something that people need to hear and understand. Because like you said, the, the change that it can bring. Do you act, Do you get a chance to play a part in the movie at all? Do you have? Is there I'm any- in the background at one point smoking a cigarette. Um, <laughs> you know, I was still working. I was I was still doing a lot. Plus, it was COVID too. Yeah. So, um, the it was one of those things that a lot of the actors were all veterans and athletes in mm-hmm. it, um, that were a part of MVP too. And that's the crazy part. I was sitting in the background at one point. Um, I just wanted to really focus on because we had to get COVID tested every time that we walked in yeah, almost a daily. And I was like, all right, I'm not sta- sitting in line at Dodger stadium for three hours just to go get a COVID test. Yeah. Everybody did. Yeah. Believe it or not, we had a lot of support for this film. Nate had beyond support. I mean, there was 30, 40 people on set almost daily just to help. Yeah. Um, nobody wanted anything. They just wanted to help at the end of the day. So the support that we had was huge for it. That's that's amazing just for that. Like you said, if, you, you thought that when you were seven years old or whatever, in seventh grade, and your grandfather said, this is this is what you're going to do. <laughs> but to be, you know, the path that you went down to the lives that you're able to change with this, it's, you know, it's amazing. I said, when we first talked of just hearing the story of how it can, how it translates through. I know, um, you know, there's been some, somebody, Tom Brady made a comment, I guess, the other day about yeah. it feels like going to war. And some people take it this way and some people take it that way but so what i mean what are your what's your perspective on i know in the beginning you yeah. said you couldn't correlate how an athlete can be the same as a as a as a vet so what do you i mean what are your thoughts on that when people come through with a comment that's that to, to that effect of right yeah. i mean because some people want to take it and run with it oh my gosh he's he's this he's this and this but you know i i've i've chosen when somebody makes a comment to just smile and just laugh right and then there's a Tom Brady that is an amazing individual that's done a lot for the community, done a lot for people. And, you know, he's already going through a lot. He already has cameras in their face, but how many other veterans say something stupid to a lot of times, right? Mm-hmm. How, but we don't have those cameras in our exactly. faces, you know? And so I sit back and I, I look at this comment and I say, you know what? There is a lot of mindsets that when they are on that field, they are, and they're, mm-hmm. they're going for blood. They're going for, and mind you, it's not a deployment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's not a deployment. Yeah. But I can tell you that I've watched a, a friend of mine on the field, and his eyes are red. You're going in, and you're going for blood. You're going for how can I take this person out? At the end of the day, it's for that two hours. It's for that three hours that they're on the field, right? And then once they get that uniform off, they're smiling all over again. So I also look at it when I was on patrol. I was in that mindset. And then when I was back in the FOB, hey, I was playing poker. Yep. I wasn't in that mindset, you know? So I have mixed feelings on it. I, I kind of choose also to just smile and just say, hey, it's a moment in time. You know, we say a lot of stupid comments all the time, and I just don't have a camera in my face all the time. <laughs> and it could have, yeah, it could have just been one of those where, I mean, I've never been deployed, but being around you guys understanding that the, the it's more the mental side of it, right? You're you're away from family. I mean, like I said, it's – they're. Uh, comparison but it, the mentality of you're away from family here you're you're gone from here right you you guys were just out longer but it, right it, it on the surface yes it kind of and that's why this mvp was created right to be able to put them together to understand so people can see but you're right it's just yeah playing sports is like uh, like being over and out, out on out on patrol or what no, but no it's not because nobody's firing bullets over your head you yeah, don't know where it's coming you know, from and, and so even when you were on the field you know i guarantee you when you were out there if somebody came up to go and say hi to you, you're like, dude, I'm in the middle of a game right yeah. now. Like, I got you the tickets, but, like, leave me alone right now. Yeah. I'm on a mission. I'm, I'm yeah. here to play, to well, win. You know, and that was where your mindset was at all yeah. the time. So. Yeah, and that's just how we, that's how we're trained, right? We get, right. it's just, you well, step we were, across well, that we were line, talking about earlier. Yeah. You know, is, is I wasn't very good on, in you know, doing drill. But then once I had that mission, I was always playing football, baseball, so on and so on growing up. And I had that mission. Yeah. I had to block every all the noise out kind of thing, and there's a lot of noise going around right now. So. Yeah, there is, but it's, and like you said, you're, you've learned to take it with a grain of salt and understand that oh, yeah. people are going to, but, and that's what it is. So the world, is this a world premiere for the movie? How is, is no, this a so, nationwide so, premiere? So Nate's been uh, going around doing tour mm-hmm. lately. Um, he's been going around to city to city, 
They had their initial premiere in Los Angeles because that's where it was filmed. They were able to get all the families, just everybody out there. I think that was September 14th, something like that. I can't remember. Um, but Nate's been kind of jumping around from city to city, and this will be the big, big, big premiere um, screening over in on November 8th, um, which is the DFW screening. Mm -hmm. um, it's at the Ford Center at the Star. Um, we can unfortunately only have 350 people. We may have to bump that up a tad bit because we're almost full right now. So um, we've had it pushed out for five days, and it's almost full at the 350 almost. So uh, there's the Eventbrite link to sign up. Um, I can share that with you, all that good stuff. But yeah, we can share it on on the on the page, on the website page. It's and everything. definitely raw. I always say don't bring anybody under the age of 16 unless they understand what transition is as well because there is some vulgar language, and it really portrays really what a veteran and an athlete really does does go through at the end of the day you know you, I, you those movies you know you talk some of those i remember when saving private ryan came out a lot of the world war ii vets that are still around at, couldn't even make it through the opening opening scenes that's how i mean so when you see this when you see the movie what does it make you feel how does it make you feel as far as the, the, the kind of like the, the flashback type of stuff or, or, or are you able to now mentally understand that that's the, the old me i understand but what and, and it's just a part of the scars that you've dealt with that are making you who you are today i think in the beginning well every time i see it i tear up yeah every time um and i will say this is that i realize and i think i tear up more now because i know how many people it's going to impact and listening to everybody's reviews on it listening to what everybody has to say about it it's like all right cool because i felt like it was a great movie I felt like, wow, this is impactful, right? Mm -hmm. And then hearing everybody else and, and you're walking out of the theater or wherever you are and you're hearing my favorite part of it or the best part or I can relate with that. And then truth be told, I watched a, a pretty big name athlete walk out in tears, you know, and I said, good. Because a lot of times we don't know how to feel mm -hmm. and that's challenging somebody to feel at the end of the day and we've blocked it off so many times i've seen i've seen athletes more a lot of times block it off mm -hmm. they're not ready you know so on and so on and i think allowing that athlete to fill because this transition talk for athletes is not talked about mm -hmm. right is and how i explain this too is i will say this is that i think the mental health for the athletes is basically 2009 where where the veterans were yeah we're we're way behind the curve but it's always been there, but nobody's been talking about it. And I think that's where we're kind of at now is we're about two years in or so, two, two to three years in talking about mental health for the athlete side of things. And you're right, it, it, you know, people see the athletes, even actors, right? I'm sure that they deal with it, but oh, they're making all this money. They've got, right? That just leads, sometimes the people are just empty with it, right? They just, it's, it's a facade that you see on, mm -hmm. you just see what's on TV, you don't see, you know the other eight nine hours of the hard work that that gets put in behind the scenes and everything yep. else and that's why it's oh they'll they'll just be okay right but at, at the end of the day we're all humans right 100%. and it's and that's what that's what it's about and, and i think you are right you know especially you know a lot of these more of the context football the cte and hockey as well of what these guys deal with and being able to right hey i've got i've got an issue yeah. so and, and this idea of the program is just you know, like you said, it's in the, it's in the infant stages, but this has the potential to go to be in all these majors, especially where the athletes are, because it's it's bringing them together, right? Yeah. It's bringing up the guys who had a face in the military, <laughs> the guys who had a face, and they're coming together to figure it out. You know, we can help each other out. And at the same time, right? You're just basically leveling the playing field for those guys to be able to say, "I'm this is this is what I need," right? Yeah. And it, maybe if it's not working out, maybe if they're doubt. We're out going then you not go playing golf, right? Oh, I mean, just able just to, like you said, just fellowship. Talk about it, man. This is what's bothering me, man. Yeah. Hey, I've got something for you to be able to help. And that that's the beauty of 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 what of what this can do, right? And I know I've put you in touch with some athletes in different cities and, and the guys watching. If you guys know of anybody that needs help in these in these cities that we played in, even if even if you're not an athlete, but you know somebody that hey, just reach out. Reach out to Denver. They've got a website to reach out to to help these guys and and to make this as as 
as big as it can be, but to be able to to help these guys so we don't lose someone every 22 seconds. Is that what it, right? The 22 goes every 22 yeah, seconds? I don't, I don't, I don't think, think the net number's right anymore. Yeah, but. so I mean, it, but it's in just with the way that yeah. everything's been the last few years, I'm sure these numbers are going up. So, I mean, we've got to be able to, and maybe this is the ideal time for this to come out to be able to people to say, yeah, I know somebody that, that hey, that can listen. That this, even if they're not an athlete, right? It doesn't have to be and that. Then but I'll say this too: is there, it doesn't even have to be struggling too. Yeah, I want the strong individuals mm-hmm. that had a good transition mm-hmm. as well, right? Because then you guys, if there's somebody that that had a great transition, guide me in the right direction. I'm still growing as an individual, right? There's still times I get down on myself as well, and I'm sitting there and, you know, looking at my girlfriend like. Oh, not in the mood right now just 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 but that's why you have the buddies you know? though right and then that's when i reach out and a lot of times i'm reaching out to the athletes now yeah and i'm like dude like help me out here and i say this a lot too is um i get to hang out with my heroes growing up and now they get to hang out with their heroes too so it's us coming together and just hanging out to be honest with you and i want to hear about successes we we had an athlete that just got out two years ago a year and a half ago he was coming into MVP and then he disappeared. And I was like, where'd he go? So I hit him up. He's like, dude, I'm doing great. I'm in Waco right now. I'm getting my master's, this and that. I'll be back soon. He just moved back, got his master's, you know, because a lot of these athletes don't graduate college, mm-hmm. right? So they have to go back, which is just like us, you know? So um, he comes back and he's in there weekly, checking in, going and golfing with them, you know, hanging out, doing what we got to do. I say this too is I want to bring them into my world. I want to teach them about a gun, how to clear a house. I want to teach them how to take apart a gun, how to put it together, so on and so on. But that's not just it. I want to teach them about marching, for instance, about drill, <laughs> teach them about a day to day, what we did in the military. But then I want to learn about the athletes too. What was your day like? What time did you have to go into the office? How was it with batting practice? How long did you do bat- batting practice? Was there any standing around? What are some of the drills that I can learn, right? Teach me so that way, because that would be fun for me on top of it. For an athlete, teach me what your drills are. Teach me how to go through a film, right? Mm -hmm. Teach me the hours and hours for one play. A lot of people don't see that. You talk about the eight hours. None of us have ever, well, I can speak on my side. I've never walked through a play in my life. Teach me what that looks like. Teach me it. Yeah. And that's all it is. Like you said, if you have changed one person's life, you've done your job. And that's it, right? Of just somebody hearing a story, but it's amazing. We talked about some of the guys and Shea Helmbrand put you in contact with yeah. out in Scottsdale of being able to to do that, right? Because Shea knows one person that, mm-hmm. that needs the help, right? And now all of a sudden now we've it's, it's expanded to another city, right? Yeah. And then so that and that's all it is. It's just it's just it's just talking about it. And I, that is the biggest part of it. Just that's it. Just talk about it. Just right. I mean and it's amazing, though, Denver, for what you know, what you've been through to what to where you are now, to the lives that you guys are changing, um, and you know, it, it, it's it's fun. I think you know, you you miss being a kid, and I think that's why you got to where you. This kind of helps you kind of be a kid again, doesn't oh, it? Oh, big time, big time. There's so many opportunities for me to. When I was a kid, I dreamed of going to the Super Bowl. For instance, I went to the Super Bowl. Um, I dreamed of going into an NFL tunnel. You know, football was my big sport mm-hmm. growing up, and baseball was a little bit, but not as much. You know, and then, but I can actually say I, I've gone through twelve different tunnels, uh, football stadiums, so on and so on. And then I get to hang out with them, and it's like, pff, what? Yeah. You know, because that was my thing growing up. I mean, we had a poster inside the house saying. Um, this, this marriage is interrupted because of the football season or something like that, you know, is it, it was a holiday. My, my mom still texts me and says, happy football season every, every first game, you know, and I love that text. It's like, yep, yep, let's go. <laughs> do you ever catch yourself going, wait, wait, I'm, I'm, I'm a grown man now. I can't be, do you ever catch yourself doing that? The, just being a, right. You're yeah. because you're a, we're, we're all fans, right. When we see it, regardless of, of playing on that level, but still I do it when I go see athletes. You know, I'm, I'm kind of I'm a fan, but you don't want to be a fan. But, I mean, do you ever catch yourself doing I, that? I, I, it just happened to me last week, to be honest <laughs> with you. Um, you know, I, I keep it together fairly, fairly well because I've gotten to meet a decent amount of people. Yeah. But I met my uh, – the tight end. I'm a, I'm a Green Bay Packers fan and Jermichael Finley, and he already knew, knew it. He started laughing because I was, I was stumbling. 
I couldn't speak. You didn't give one of these, did you? No, I was oh, I was <laughs> really close. I was like, what's, what's up, man? How you doing? You know? And he's like, you good, bro? And I was like, yeah, man. And I started laughing because it was just like, that was one person that I've always been wanting to meet. Yeah. And then he lives down in Fort Worth. And it was like, I wanted to just spit everything out at him. I'm like, we got this. We got this fundraiser. We got this. We got that. I want you involved. And he was like, cool. I'm there. Like just completely calm and you know. Did I'm he know there. you were before all this, or was it just? Oh, I, I you know, in the very beginning, I, yeah. I let them know, and I'm like, hey, just letting you know, man, I'm, I'm a huge fan. Um, I've watched you. I really I had you on my fantasy football every year. I this. <laughs> we need to talk about the points know, that you didn't like, get me a couple of times. Know, like, um, but you know him and then Aaron Rodgers. I, it was funny. I didn't even get still slipped up with Sylvester Stallone, but Aaron Rodgers. I'm, I met him and I was like. I had nothing to say. He's like, so how you doing? And I was like, he seems uh, like he's got a lot of sarcasm with him when he sits there, but you know, he, he actually started talking and this was a couple years ago and he talked about transition. He said, I have no idea what I'm going to do when I get out. He said, he said it flat out. He was like, what you're doing right now is good because it's going to get us ready for the future. And he, he sparked up what we do as an organization because he literally said, but right now, football is my life. After that, who knows? I may go golf, he said, and who knows? But right now, football is my life. It's because it's been their identity, right? And that's right. that's what it's yeah. that's what it's about. But it's it's amazing on the, the reach and the amount of people that you've that you've actually you know you talked to, and it, and you know as you, we sit here and talk about it, just the, my mind starts processing. Who else <laughs> do I know that has dealt with that? Can sit down and have that conversation with you, absolutely, um, and and help this this program organization go go global are you guys international at all yet technically yes and technically no so we do have we have the eight chapters and then we have the zoom option as well so technically if you qualify for the program you could be in japan we've had somebody jump on from germany uh from italy for instance um, that's wanted to start the chat once they do the vetting process of going through it and seeing what's around because i mean there's military bases all over the world yep. And I'm, I'm sure they're athletes as well, but it doesn't always have to have, but could be, I mean, you look at it, it doesn't have to be, it could be a soccer player right yep. over there in Germany. That's, yep. that's, that's, that's doing this. So, I mean, it's, it's we've, amazing. We've had a couple of British army jump on um, our, you know, we've had, we've had a quite a bit actually jumping on and, you know, if British army, they, they're here in the States, of course, they can definitely sign up just showing proof that they served in combat zone and we'd love to have them. And, even the athlete side of things, soccer, there's a lot of them, you know, even basketball, CFL, so on and so on. Um, you think about that, Japan, if they played in the major leagues in Japan, awesome, come on in, you yeah. know. So um, we're definitely, all they really got to do is show the proof on the and website. And they can, they so. can, people can go, just is it, what's the website? Uh, vetsandplayers.org. Vetsandplayers.org, okay. Yep. Donation, anything, donations, all that stuff tells always, you all about. Always donations, we want to keep, keep the doors open. A lot of times individuals think that, we may have the financials because of who we work with. And at the same time, we got to keep those doors open, right? Mm -hmm. Is those are also taking care of the veterans and the athletes. And there's, and a lot of people don't realize there's hardly any resources for the athletes and the percentage of the athletes that do go bankrupt, yep. you know, real quick a year, two years after, because they, their spending habits, you know, is we're, we're a resource for them and we want to keep those doors open. So donations are huge. We got a supporter shirt on the website. We got GNC that's helped us out quite a bit. We have, um, you know, the NFL, Roger Goodell's in on it because he understands how important it is to get some of it, those guys in with us. And you are a 501c3? We are. We are. So on donations and stuff that everybody can, can make. You can buy some merchandise as well on the yep. website and everything uh, else. I think we're launching a hat in like Veterans Day, I believe. I need a visor. Yeah, uh, you know, sorry, <laughs> we're not golf yet. <laughs> I need me a I need me a need me a visor and everything else, but the shirts and stuff. So it's, um, and so I, I, I want to touch base on the shirts and, and swag gear too. Is everything's earned within it too, um, within the program. So shirts, and it's about the times that you come into program. Mm -hmm. So shirts, you earn it after your fourth time, and that's because of the four preseason games with. NFL, right? Mm -hmm. You earn your name tag on the back of your jersey. So we call our shirts the jersey. Um, you earn your hat, you earn your sweatshirt, you earn your coin. We got a challenge coin that we pass out. So depending on the times that you come in, you actually earn everything. And 
reason why is because you earn everything while you're in your sport or when you were a veteran. I earned all my medals. I earned all my, my badges. Mm-hmm. I didn't realize how important those were until I got out. And then everybody's like, oh, what you get? So when you see the MVP logo, when you see the hat, you know somebody earned it at the end of the day. So when you see that out in the community, it's something that we want to make sure that that stuff is special. And I mean, we wear it in pride. We wear it because we want to wear it. So somebody that hasn't earned it, yep. you won't see that logo out there. You got to put the work in, yep. which, is, exactly. which is understandable. And that's part of it, right? That's the yep. process of what you guys deal with and go through. And you know, benefits you and it benefits all those guys all over. So, you know, we're look, definitely looking to grow this. Make Absolutely. into a big thing. So, th- so when can people that aren't can't get into the movie? When will they be able to see? I believe it's going on to on demand a little bit after Veterans Day. Um, okay. I'm not 100 percent sure um, that announcement will be made at the movie. Oh, okay, <laughs> perfect. So they can people can see on on Facebook. You're on Instagram. You're on Twitter. All that stuff. You can see the you can see uh, the trailer on there. And you know any questions. To, I'm sure whoever's running those accounts is able to answer the questions. Yeah. Like I said, guys, reaching out to these people. They can always see. email me directly yeah. as well, uh, dmorris at vetsandplayers.org. So they can is always. it on the website as well? Right. I don't know. Um, I haven't gone on there for about a week or two, and we're switching We're switching a lot. So we're yeah. we're in that fancy stage of, like, just revamping it. We, we've we impacted a lot of people over the last seven years, and we want to make sure that that number is right. For instance, we've done a lot in the community as well we want to start highlighting that stuff so we have a lot that we're going to be doing to it yeah um, yeah well but denver i appreciate it today you know coming in and, and telling your story because like we said one person you've done your job right that's that's all we can ask for and, and you never know how far this this can go but you know like i said look forward to it with getting out helping out in the community you know we deal there's a lot of military stuff that goes on around here so we run into a whole bunch of people mm-hmm. and just saying and you know somebody that didn't need help today doesn't mean they don't need it tomorrow Right exactly. to come through and just say, "Hey, man, I heard your story." You don't even have to be a vet; just somebody that you having an issue, right? Because you're if you you're afraid to even ask, right? Because sometimes yep. some people are afraid. Oh, yeah. Even if you're just your average Joe working on the street, yep. I could, hey, reach out, right? Denver, you, anybody they can help out, and that's all it is. Just, all you gotta do is say something. We know it's nothing to be ashamed of, right? Oh. It's just just scars that made us made us who we are. I don't think I've called the cops on one person in seven years. I think I've shown up. Yeah. In seven years. And I, I can say that right there is that I won't ever call anybody if somebody's struggling and they're going through something. I, I will just show up yeah. and just be a friend and just sit there, even if I don't know you. <laughs> yeah. Some, all you get, he said, sometimes all you do is just sit there and listen. Right. Exactly. I and mean, hopefully people today were listening and somebody hears it and wants to wants to uh, wants to reach out. So, well, you know, like I said, we'll see how far this goes. And like I said, I'm looking forward to it. Looking forward to to, to the movie. And uh, like I said, we just appreciate you for joining us today and for taking the time out. And doing, yeah. So, and uh, like I said, guys, check this, check the uh, the website out. And like I said, hopefully the movie will be out sooner or later for you guys to see. And uh, until next time here on the Dub Network and the Big Head Pod. Thanks, guys.